Welcome everybody to this workshop, which is entitled, I saw to take her as my bride. Uh, quotation from Wisdom 8.2. I have to give a little warning to you, even if it's too late for you now to escape. <laughs> we Germans are famous for reading out our conferences. In German, if you attend a lecture in the university, it's literally called Vorlesung, which means the professor reads his book to you in a very monotonous voice. I don't complain about my capacity to speak English. I'm very glad I know it the, as well as I do, but I still don't feel comfortable to speak from the fullness of my heart. So bear with me if I have to remain a very, very German and read out my <laughs> presentation. <laughs> if I go too fast or too monotonous, you can make signs or just start leaving, then I'll get the... <laughs> <laughs> okay, let us start with a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, with you is wisdom, who knows your works and was present when you made the world. Who understands what is pleasing in your eyes and what is conformable with your commands? Send her forth from your holy heavens and from your glorious throne dispatch her, that she may be with me and work with me, that I may know what is pleasing to you, for she knows and understands all things and will guide me prudently in my affairs and safeguard me by her glory. Thus, my deeds will be acceptable, and I will judge your people justly and be worthy of my Father's throne. Mary, seat of wisdom, intercede for us in this hour in which we contemplate about the mystery of wisdom in the scriptures and in our own life. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. It was in the beginning, is now, and shall be, world without end. Amen. A second remark, you have these handouts, Personally, I find it, I can't listen to a speaker and read a handout at the same time. Um, however, as presenters, um, I made this for those of you who feel I'm quoting too many passages and you don't follow writing down. So for that sake, you have the handout. So after the conference, if you want, you can go back and you have all the scriptures on these handouts, but you don't need to follow on the handout while I am presenting. But you can, of course. I sought to take her as my bride on the spousal role of wisdom in the life of the sage. The sage is each and every one of you who are baptized. Wisdom literature views the quest for wisdom like the quest for a beloved woman. Wisdom is to be found like one found, finds a good wife. The youth is to call her his sister, which is a common term of endearment in the ancient Near East. Syrac exhorts us to peer through her windows and listen at her doors, like a lover does outside the door of his beloved. And Solomon describes wisdom as his own bride, whom he loved above all else and whom he decided to take as a consort. The injunctions to love and search for wisdom are so strong that one is reminded of the first commandment to love the Lord with all one's heart and soul and strength, Deuteronomy 6.5. Only if wisdom is itself divine can such surrender of self to her pursuit seem acceptable. And yet, wisdom, or her Greek counterpart called Sophia, appears as a female personification a mediating figure between God and humans, and not really like the creator God himself. How then is it possible that the Bible summons us to love and seek her with such submission? The question imposes itself, who is she after all? 
And how am I, a Christian of the 21st century, to love and seek her as my bride? For a Catholic, this so-called lady wisdom looks unsettlingly similar to Our Lady and her role in the mystery of salvation. In fact, wisdom texts like Proverbs 8, we just had it recently in the Feast of the Trinity, Syrach 24 and Wisdoms chapter 7 to 9 have been used in the liturgy for Marian feast days down through the centuries up to the Second Vatican Council. The texts suit her in so many ways. Mary, she is the seat of wisdom, the mediatrix of all grace, the mother of good counsel, a living temple, God's paradise, the source and mother of all life, etc., etc. But can such a Catholic devotion stand the test of the enlightened mind and even that of orthodoxy? After all, Mary is neither pre-existent nor God's emanation, neither divine nor by herself a reflection of God's glory. All these attributes hold true of Christ, but not of his mother. Mary is like us, God's creature, even though she is immaculate and the highest of all creatures. Thus, why, thus while we would hesitate to attribute to Mary a sentence like, um, she is a breath of the power of God and a pure emanation of his glory, we would immediately agree to apply the second part of this sentence to her, nothing defiled gains entrance into her. How can these seeming contradictions, on the one hand, you think of her and the church is using her, and on the other hand, all this seems to apply a goddess, or at least a god, how can these contradictions be resolved? Are we or are we not to see Mary in these texts and therefore love and seek her as like a bride? In what follows, I will first have a look at all the relevant biblical texts with you. Before we proceed with the question of who this wisdom figure is and where she comes from and whom she points to. Second, the texts in scriptures, and those are the texts you find on your handout. In the book of Proverbs, wisdom is to be found like one finds a good wife. So compare the text on the handout. For example, Proverbs 3, verse 13, happy the man who finds wisdom and the man who gets understanding. Or 8, 17, I, wisdom says, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently will find me. Now compare that to chapter 31, verse 10. A good wife, who can find? She's far more precious than jewels. Or here the parallelism is even more clearer in the second line, Proverbs 8.35. For he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Now look at the parallel with the wife in 18.22 on the right side. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So finding wisdom obtains favor from the Lord and finding a good wife obtains favor from the Lord. It's really superposed the two realities. Wisdom is so then to be acquired like one acquires a wife. In the Bible you acquire a wife. It's a technical term the Bible uses, particularly in the book of Ruth. Now listen what bo the book of Proverbs says about how to get wisdom in Proverbs 4 verses 5 to 8. Acquire wisdom, this is number two on the handout, acquire wisdom, acquire insight. Do not forsake her and she will keep you. Love her and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this, acquire wisdom and whatever you get is insight. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. With regard to this acquisition of wisdom, the context makes it very clear that we're not talking about purchasing her, like buying her. There is no talk of purchase. The price of purchase is not mentioned. Instead, we read about faithfulness and love in verse 6 caressing and embracing. And while the Hebrew term that's used here, it's the famous Hebrew term, ahav, 
may describe both an erotic love between a man and a woman and a spiritual love for God, the Greek translation makes it very clear that an erotic connotation is intended because the, the Septuagint translates erao, and that's the verb from which we have the term eros in English. Yeah? So you are to love wisdom with an erotic love, the book of Proverbs tells us. The sage, moreover, advises the youth in Proverbs 7.4, call wisdom your sister. If you have an annotated Bible, for example, the NAB or any other annotated Bible, it will probably tell you in the footnotes that sister and brother were common terms of endearment between lovers in the ancient Near Eastern love literature. And we find an excellent example of that in the Song of Songs. For example, in Song 4, 9 to 10, there the lover says to, her, to his bride, you have rav ravished my heart, my sister, my bride. You have ravished my heart with the glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How sweet is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than spice. We come to the book of Sirach. Sirach in 1422 to 27, summons us to pursue wisdom like a hunter. Yet the way this hunt is described, describes closely or resembles closely the behavior again of the lover in the Song of Songs, who stands behind the wall of the beloved's house, gazing at the window. Cyrax says in 1422, pursue wisdom like a hunter and lie in wait on her path. He who peers through her windows will also listen at her doors. He who encamps near her house will also fasten his tent back to her walls. Now compare Song 2, 9. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. Syrac 15, 1 to 6. Furthermore, compares wisdom to a mother and a bride who nourishes, again, a very f utterly female figure. Sirach 15, he who holds the law will obtain wisdom. She will come to meet him like a mother and like a wife of his youth, she will welcome him. She will feed him with the bread of understanding and give him the water of wisdom to drink. It is, however, above all, the book of the wisdom of Solomon which makes use of the sexual imagery as its main literary vehicle for communicating the need of a personal and intimate relationship with wisdom. Thus, the book of the wisdom of Solomon describes wisdom, just as we saw in the previous books, as a woman who is to be loved sought after and found like one finds a beloved woman. Take, for example, Wisdom 6.12. That is number six on your handouts. Wisdom is radiant and unfading. She is easily discerned by those who love her and is found by those who seek her. She hastens to make herself known to those who desire her. He who rises early to seek her will have no difficulty, for he will find her sitting at his gates. To fix one's thought on her is perfect understanding, and he who is vigilant on her account will soon be free from care, because she goes about seeking those worthy of her, and she graciously appears to them in their path and meets them in every thought. Unlike a shy girl, she does not make a lot of fuss, nor needs a lot of pressing. Rather, she hastens to make herself known to those who desire her. She will even be found waiting at the gate of him who is willing to rise early to find her. She goes about seeking those worthy of her, and she graciously appears to them in their path and meets them in every thought. While these metaphors are familiar from the book of Proverbs and Ben Syra, the book of wisdom goes even further in its development of the spousal metaphor. In fact, King Solomon, the exemplary sage of the book of wisdom, describes her as his bride, nymphe in Greek. You probably know that word. 
his bride whom he loved above all else, wisdom 7.10, and whom he decided to take as his consort. Wisdom 7.8, I preferred her to scepters and thrones, and I, ac I accounted wealth as nothing in comparison with her. Neither did I liken to her any priceless gem, because all gold is but a little sand in her sight, and silver will be accounted as clay before her. I loved agapeza. Here you have the Greek um, agape, yeah? You know that from your New Testament conferences. I, I loved her with agape more than health and beauty. And I chose to have her rather than light because her radiance never ceases. She's more than the light. All good things came to me along with her and in her hands uncounted wealth. You're reminded of Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be given unto thee. All good things come along with her and in her hands uncounted wealth. I rejoice in them all because wisdom leads them. But... I did not know that she was their mother. I learned without guile and I impart without grudging. I do not hide her wealth. For it is an unfailing treasure for men. Those who get it obtain friendship with God, commended for the gifts that come from her instruction. A little sneak preview to open your ears to the Marian dimension. If you hear a phrase like, those who get it obtain friendship with God reminds you of that timeless sentence, a child of Mary will never be lost. No? You all know this conviction if you have a child, a, a nephew, whatever, someone you're praying for who you can't see finding conversion. We, we have this deep trust. We consecrate that person to Mary and the person won't be lost. Those who get obtain friendship with God, uh, those who get... Um, wisdom obtained friendship with God. It also reminds of that phrase of Grignot de Montfort who says, wherever the Holy Spirit finds a soul dwelling, finds Mary dwelling in a soul, he rushes on that soul. But uh, here I'm jumping ahead. We're still <laughs> just obtain, uh, observing our texts. In a remarkable hymn which you have uh, on your handouts, uh, in, verse, in uh, handout 8, but I'm not going to read it entirely now, um, we'll return to this later. Solomon then sings her praises, listing all of wisdom's virtues, and then he concludes, I loved, now this time he loves her ephileza, so that's philein, this friendship love. I loved her and sought her from my youth, and I desired to take her as my bride, nymphe, and I became enamored erastes of her beauty. So again, he uses that verb from which we have eros. Yeah, he, he loved her with an erotic love. She glorifies her noble birth by living with God. The, what the Greek is saying here, she, is, she lives with God like, like our unmarried people nowadays cohabitate. Yeah? <laughs> she, she is the one uh, who is God's life partner. And the Lord of all loves her. Agapeze. God loves her with all his agape. For she is an initiate, mystis, the Greek says, and that's where we get the word mystic, mysticism from, yeah? She is a mist see, she's initiated in into all of God's knowledge and an associate in God's works. Therefore, now Solomon says, I determined to take her to live with me. So she cohabitates with God, and now Solomon says, Therefore, I want her to cohabitate with me. Same verb, word in Greek. Knowing that she would give me good counsel and encouragement in cares and grief. Because of her, I shall have immortality and leave an everlasting remembrance to those who come after me. When I enter my house, I will find rest with her. Remember, rest is the good we're looking for in the Old Testament, the country of my rest. In her we find rest. What does Jesus say? Come to me, all who are burdened, and you will find rest. It's the good of salvation. For companionship with her has no bitterness, and life with her, now again he uses that word symbiosis, the cohabitation with her has no pain, but gladness and joy. 
When I considered these things inwardly and thought upon them in my mind, that kinship with wisdom, that in kinship with wisdom there is immortality, and in friendship with her pure delight, and in the labors of her hands unfailing wealth, and in the experience of her company, understanding and renown in sharing her words, then I went about seeking that I may take her into my own. Make a strong mental note on this phrase because we will re-encounter it in the New Testament. Then I went seeking that I may take her into my own. That's an Old Testament or Greek way of saying I decided to take her as my spouse. According to this description, Solomon entered into an intimate spousal relationship with wisdom. I loved her and sought her from, he loved her and sought her from his youth and desired to take her for his bride and became enamored of her beauty. And finally, he takes her as his spouse into his own. What is most astounding, however, apart from this explicitly spousal and almost erotic language in application to divine wisdom, is the fact that Solomon describes wisdom, first of all, as being God's life partner. She glorifies her noble birth by living with God, and the Lord of all loves her, he says in verse 3. It is God's life partner whom Solomon determines to take as his own companions in the words, I determined to take her to live with me, knowing that she would give me good counsel and encouragement in care and grief. Thus, while or rather because she is God's companion, Solomon takes her for his own companion. It is precisely wisdom's extraordinary spouse-like relationship to the creator of all, as the book says, that renders her capable of mediating all the divine attributes like understanding, prophecy, immortality, etc., etc. Who then is this wisdom who is God's consort and at the same time so readily gives herself to man as a mother and bride? As a German scholar named Ruben Zimmermann has phrased it, Solomon seems to be describing a love triangle. God, whose spouse is wisdom, but who also is the spouse of Solomon. Before we look at the Christian interpretation of these passages, I want to draw your attention to the historical background that scholars made out behind the description of wisdom, as it will shed an, an interesting light on the real love triangle which the Holy Spirit might have intended to prefigure here when he inspired the writing of the Book of Wisdom. Isis Sophia. Isis is an Egyptian goddess. In relation to wisdom's persona as a lover and bride and wife, a recasting of the ancient sacred marriage myth appears to be at work. Don't panic, I'll explain. <laughs> and I'll return to orthodoxy. <laughs> The peoples of the ancient Near East surrounding Israel all shared in a more or less common sacred, so-called sacred marriage tradition in which a female goddess, consort of the supreme god, was traditionally a mediating figure between her spouse, the god, the supreme god, and the king, with whom she similarly enjoyed a spousal relationship. Wisdom was understood to be a divine prerogative. Yeah? It was clear wisdom belongs to the gods. Needed, however, by the kings to fulfill the god-given office to act as god's lieutenant on er lieutenants on earth and govern the people with justice and righteousness. Wherefore, Solomon's first act is to pray for wisdom in order to be able to govern God's people. Hence, the pagan believe that the kings enjoyed a privileged relationship with a goddess who, thanks to her intimate relationship with, God, with the supreme god, would mediate the wisdom necessary for governance to the king. For that reason, most of the cultures surrounding Israel had developed a pronounced goddess worship. A cult of this kind was particularly popular in Alexandria in the second century BC, the city where the book of wisdom was written with all likelihood. Here, the ancient Egyptian goddess Isis, whom you might have already heard about, had been revitalized. 
the Egyptian royal theology ascribed to Isis a principal role in securing kingship for the monarch and providing him with knowledge and ability to reign. This role of hers had been popularized in the second century when the Book of Wisdom was written and she was now venerated as the giver of wisdom and the founder of scientific knowledge for mankind. Now modern scholarship is demonstrated because nowadays we're lucky thanks to archaeology um, that we found lots of texts about this veneration of Isis and because we have these texts now suddenly we discovered wow what we read in the book of wisdom the Egyptians were saying about their goddess Isis and so it has become quite clear that the author of the book of wisdom has adopted a genius rhetoric in order to convince his um, contemporary Jews who were living with him in, in Alexandria, surrounded by all these pagans, and you can imagine these pagan cults to Isis were very seductive, yeah? In, and in order to prevent them from going after Isis, he is teaching them through this book who the true wisdom is, who uh, the true source of knowledge is, and by precisely adopting that terminology that was writ written in the praises of Isis. So what we found in these texts that exist is that the so-called priests of Isis had written lists in the praises of Isis. And we find the exact same list in the Book of Wisdom, but now praising God's wisdom. For example, um, Wisdom 722, it's handout number 8. It, this is Wisdom 722. In her there is a spirit that is intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, mobile, clear, unpolluted, distinct, invulnerable, loving the good, keen, irresistible, beneficent, humane, steadfast, sure, free from anxiety, all-powerful, overseeing all and penetrating through all spirits that are intelligent and pure and most subtle. In order to Im immunize his Jewish fellow citizens against the seductions of this Isis cult, the author of the Book of Wisdom very cleverly used the exact same terminology of these hymns in honor of Isis and then applied them to description of God's transcendent wisdom. Not union with Isis, but with Israel's wisdom will pro procure you with understanding life and immortality, he's saying. Sophia, not Isis, the Book of Wisdom declares powerfully, is the teacher and revealer of God's will and initiator into encyclopedic knowledge. The student of Sophia is promised immortality and nearness to God. And just as Isis was believed to be the Egyptian king's wife and advisor of divine rank, so wisdom is here described as Solomon's advisor and a companion on the throne who rules over all. Indeed, wisdom is praised as all-seeing, omniscient, even omnipotent. Her spirit is holy and unique. All these attributes that the pagan cult had attributed to Isis. The message is clear. True wisdom and immortality are to be found only with God's wisdom, who contrary to the pagan belief is neither a goddess nor any other kind of minor divinity. Thus, while Sophia wisdom is no longer an independent goddess in her own right, but an expression of the Lord's wisdom, this so in recast goddess nevertheless remains the mediator between God and man through her simultaneous spousal relationship with God and the sage. Now why am I relating all this ancient Eastern mytholo mythological stuff to you? For one thing, it is helpful and necessary to know that revelation did not happen in vacuo, in an empty space. Yeah? God, when revealing his mysteries, adopts the language of the people he is revealing himself to. Language, in this sense, does not only refer to Hebrew and Aramaic or Greek. Rather, the language of revelation comprises the metaphors and the religious symbols known to the people whom revelation is addressed to. Everyone knew the pagan belief in goddesses who were allegedly mediators of wisdom. Now, was this merely a heresy? Or can we categorize them as somehow disfigured semina verbi seeds of truth that are dispersed amongst the cultures of this world? You might know this famous phrase of C.S. Lewis who speaks of the 
true dreams of the pagans. Yeah? These pagans dream of this female figure that is somehow interceding for us with God and, and mediating God who is so overwhelmingly powerful to us. That here we have a true dream of the, of the pagans who will become a reality in a created creature whom we will see later. But think, for example, in almost our own days, only 500 years ago, of Our Lady's apparition to Juan Diego in Guadalupe. It made so much sense to the Indians precisely because her coming had been prepared even by the Aztec prophets and because in her appearance, in her image, she applied all these pagan symbolisms to herself. In a similar way, the Jews, at the time of the Book of Wisdom, were graced with a deeper understanding of wisdom and her spousal role in the life of the sage, precisely on the background of these pagan myths. If the pagans were able to believe all these things about Isis, how much more would a Jew come to understand the true nature of wisdom? More importantly, however, he would emulate the pagans' fervent devotion and apply it to the true God. However, what is actually being revealed by using the pagan archetype? The sage's love for wisdom is first of all legitimized and, sorry, the sage's love for wisdom, not pagan, is first of all legitimized and enkindled by a similar love of God for her. Wisdom, who is described as being at once God's and Solomon's life partner, cohabitator, symbiosis in Greek, thus becomes the relational link between God and the student of wisdom. Lady Wisdom's love relationship with God and at the same time with the sage are closely related, yet they remain at different levels. Contrary to a human love triangle, they don't compete, but unite that which otherwise is incompatible, the human soul and God. Lady Wisdom, in her role as a double spouse, functions as a mediator of all things divine to man. Now, again, the urging question, who is she in the light of the fullness of revelation? For anyone acquainted with the Catholic tradition, she does look like Our Lady. She's the spouse of God and the mother of humanity, the mediatrix of all grace, the privileged channel through whom God distributes his graces. But lest we run ahead, let us consider what tradition has to say. First in the Bible, according to the biblical tradition recorded in the book of Sirach and Baruch, she is the book of the covenant of the Most High God, the law which God commanded. Sirach 24 verse 23. Or according to Baruch 4.1, she is the book of the precepts of God, the law that endures forever. Now here we have an inner biblical, um, inner biblical interpretation of who wisdom is, and in the late time they figure it's God's law. Now we know who God's law is, the word of God incarnate. Significantly, she promises, those who eat me will hunger still, those who drink of me will thirst for more. Sirach 24 verse 21. You know these words from the New Testament. Jesus applies them to himself in John 4, 10 to 14 when speaking to the Samaritan woman, thereby clearly identifying himself with wisdom personified as described in the Old Testament. In Jesus, the words of Baruch 3, 37 to 38, we hear them every Christmas night, have come true. She appeared upon, er upon earth and lived among men. Baruch 3, 37. The New Testament, and the Gospel of John in particular, clearly lift the veil. God's wisdom, as described in Proverbs 8 to 9, and Wisdom 7 to 8, and Sirach 24, is none other than God's Logos, the second person of the Trinity, who has become man in Jesus Christ. The same interpretation is found in Saint Paul. Compare, for example, Wisdom 726, she is the reflection of eternal light, the spotless mirror of the power of God, the image of his goodness, to what St. Paul says about Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he is the likeness of God, or in Colossians 1.15, the image of the invisible God. 
Hebrews 1.3, he reflects the glory and bears the very stamp of God's nature. 1 Corinthians 1.24, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ has become for us wisdom from God, 1 Corinthians 1.30. In him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Colossians 2.3. Such has also been the interpretation of most of the church fathers, particularly in the Arian controversy, remember when they were fighting whether Christ was 100% divine or not really. Proverbs 8, 22 to 31 was adduced to argue for the pre-existence and divinity of the Logos. Throughout the ages, there has never been a doubt that the figure of wisdom described in the Old Testament as a mediator between God and creation is clearly a prefiguration of God's Logos, the second person of the Trinity, who with the incarnation appeared upon earth and lived among men. Baruch 3.37 Why then was God's wisdom personified as a female figure? One might ask. According to the rabbis and the early church fathers, this display this depiction of wisdom is a rhetorical device. By presenting God's law in the figure of a beautiful woman, the young man, the student of wisdom, his, the young man's desire is aroused to go after her with ardent love rather than fear and trembling, which will never induce one to love God and his laws with all one's heart and all one's soul. Once the soul has been enkindled with love for wisdom and purified by following her ways, as described in the books of Proverbs and Kohelet, it will enter into the divine holy of holies. There the soul will be united to the divine and the one who was addressed as a son in Proverbs will there be discovered himself to be the bride of the Song of Songs, that is the bride of the Messiah King, the divine bridegroom. You have a text of Gregory of Nyssa explaining that on your handout. I won't read it out now, but you understand the logic. The, the rabbis say, if you, uh, Proverbs enkindles your heart to fall in love with this woman, and you go after her and you start living how, what she instructs to, like Scott Hahn was saying last night, you, you live according to what she says, and then you're purified, and the book of Kohelet makes you realize that all this is vanity, and then you're ready to enter the Holy of Holies, which is the Song of Songs, and there suddenly you realize you're switching position. You're no longer the young man going after that beautiful woman. You realize, actually, um, she, is, she is the bridegroom. She is the Logos, in our term, Christ incarnate, and our soul is actually the spouse. There is, however, also a different, maybe less developed, but valid tradition in the church, which associates wisdom with the Holy Spirit. Again, Dr. Hahn mentioned that in his prayer this morning. Thus, St. Irenaeus of Lyon writes in the second century, you have that on handout number 13, for with him, that is God the Father, were always present the word and wisdom. So Irenaeus distinguishes the word and wisdom. And then he explains the Son and the Spirit. He equates wisdom and the Spirit. By whom and in whom freely and spontaneously God made all things, to whom he also speaks, saying, let us, Father, wisdom and word, let us make man after our own image and likeness. There are indeed good reasons to identify wisdom not just with God's logos but also with the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Book of Wisdom itself distinguishes between wisdom and the spirit of wisdom in some places. Thus, in the beginning of the Book of Wisdom we read, for example, wisdom will not enter a deceitful soul nor dwell in a body enslaved for sin. For a holy and disciplined spirit will flee from deceit. So here wisdom is characterized as a spirit. Similarly, the 21 glories of wisdom, which we praised, we read earlier, this hymn, in her is a spirit, um, undefiled, pure, th those uh, thir 21 praises, um, they are attributes of wisdom's spirit. 
In her, there's a spirit that is intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, mobile, clear, etc., etc. I prayed, Solomon says, and the spirit of wisdom came to me. And in Wisdom 970, he seems to equate wisdom and the Holy Spirit when he says, Who has learned thy counsel unless thou hast given wisdom and sent thy Holy Spirit from on high? He is very clear. As a great Russian theologian of the last century with the name Sergei Bulgakov points out, all of these expressions are undoubtedly evidence of an ontological understanding of wisdom. So something that exists outside of humanity and somehow outside of, uh, it, it, it exists, it, it has being. That's the correct under, uh, translation of ontologically. It ha wisdom has being. But scripture does not offer the possibility of referring her entirely, so to say, to the domain of the second person of the Trinity, nor entirely to the third person of the Trinity. Another good example is Wisdom 7.25 to 26, when it says, She's a breath of the power of God and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. For she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God and an, an image of his goodness. While the Holy Spirit is obviously the breath of God, the expressions emanation of glory of the Almighty, reflection of eternal light and image of his goodness, fit rather the Son, who according to Hebrew 1.3, as I read earlier, is the reflection of the glory of God and bears the very stamp of God's nature and who is the visible image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15 and whom we confess in the creed to be light of li light from light. Yeah, that's also a characterization of wisdom. Yet again, in the words, in every generation she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of gods and prophets, fit rather the description of the Holy Spirit. So what are we to do? <laughs> the great 19th century German theologian, Matthias Josef Scheben, who is not very well known, but of V great importance, and I just learned last night from Dr. Hahn that Emmaus Press is slowly translating his 12 volumes into English, which is great news because you can't buy them in German any longer, but you, Amer you Anglophones are always the one who <laughs> keep the tradition alive. <laughs> He's a very important figure, and he sees in this oscillating description of wisdom that at one point looks like the, the Logos, and then again she looks like the Holy Spirit, the very reason why. now gets a bit complicated, but not too much. <laughs> he sees here the very reason why the sapientia genita, that is the generated wisdom, yeah, which is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, you know, the second person of the Trinity is generated by the Father, is presented under the type of a female principle. On the one hand, she even says, this is so because she wisdom is dressed in colors that fit the Holy Spirit, who, as you know in Hebrew, is female, ruach. On the other hand, it follows, according to Sheben, that the application of these passages is not restricted to the incarnate wisdom, yeah, so all these passages are not restricted to incarnate wisdom, Christ, but aims at the same time at a further person, a person who stands in the order of creation in an analogical relationship to Christ, wisdom incarnate, as the Holy Spirit to the Logos and the Godhead. So in the other, in the other word he's saying, by describing wisdom as a female, the Holy Spirit is aiming at describing at the one, one hand wisdom incarnate, yeah, Christ our only mediator between God and, God and humanity, but then there is an other person who stands in relation to Christ in the same relationship or in an analogical relationship as the Holy Spirit to Christ, to the Logos, in the Trinity and how those two operate in the work of redemption. Yeah? And he says because the Holy Spirit intended to, while describing or prefiguring Christ, the incarnate wisdom, and all these wisdom texts, he also intended already to, to uh, give us an image of that person who, who will stand in relationship to the incarnate wisdom analogically as the Holy Spirit took to the Logos. And that, of course, as you know, is Mary, whom 
we also call the co-redemptrix. She truly cooperates with Christ by being this, like Maximilian Kolbe would say, quasi-incarnation of the Holy Spirit. In her, the Holy Spirit is cooperating with Christ in this work of, um, of redemption. Now, this would take an, <laughs> more than another conference to, to unfold that, but that's the reason Shaben says, why when we read the Old Testament and we and these see these wisdom texts and it's female and it looks so much like Our Lady and yet we hesitate because it seems to be a divine person, he says the Holy Spirit intended to, to not only describe Christ but at the same time point at this further person who is Mary, um, seat of wisdom and the mother of the church. Um, for Sheben and the entire liturgical and devotional tradition of the church, this person is none other than the Virgin Mary, seat of wisdom and mother of the church. Now, finally, we come to Mary. Anyone acquainted with the Catholic tradition and its Marian feasts knows that these texts, Proverb 8, Sarek 24, and Wisdom 7 to 9, have as of old, both liturgically and devotionally, been applied to Mary. Until the Second Vatican Council, for example, Proverbs 8, 22 to 31, which is the text that prefigures Christ, um, was re read on the feast days of the Immaculate Conception, and Syrach 24 was the reading for a number of devotional Marian masses. The most famous example of devotional lit uh, literature that uses the description of the pre-existent wisdom in order to incite fervor and love for Mary in the souls is, as you know, Louis de Montfort's famous true devotion to Mary. Is now that a typical deviation of Catholic um, latria, as the technical term is, or is it a legitimate hyperdolia? So are we here, as the Protestants would say, exaggerating and adoring Mary, which we don't? Or is it a legitimate way of veneration that is uh, based on the scriptures. Since the liturgy, scripture and tradition, since the liturgy is the proper sits im Leben, which like Cardinal Donato so beautifully said in the morning, you have one beautiful text in the Mass, if, even if the whole homily is not, might not be, you have the Word of God. The Word of God is not a word for the bookshelf. Uh, the Word of God, if you want to hear it in its primary context, is the liturgy. It's there that the Lord speaks through it to us. So if we hear those texts in the liturgy, we can know the church never fails in what she proclaims. Um, since the liturgy is the proper sits im Leben for the divine uh, scriptures, we may be assured that the church is not teaching heresy by applying these sapiential texts to Mary. Rather, we have here a perfect example of what we call lex orandi equals lex credendi. That means listening to the church in prayer, we can learn what the church believes. Yeah, if you want to know what the church believes, listen to what she prays. According to Sheben, the church recognizes in Mary the perfect image of her pre-existent son, the eternal wisdom of God, and thus applies those texts to Mary, which present wisdom as the perfect image and likeness of God, companion and helper, and therefore daughter of God in an eminent way that is, child and spouse at the same time, one in the form of the other. Remember those wisdom texts? They'll always describe wisdom as this child that plays before God. She's a daughter of God. She's a spouse of God. So those texts present wisdom in these female um, spouse and daughter terms. As such, with respect to the world, she, wisdom, is queen of all things, mother of life and light. The application of these texts to Mary proves that the church sees in Mary the perfect image and copy of the original prototype who is her son, Wisdom Incarnate. Yeah? Mary has truly become the perfect comic copy, copy and image of Christ. She even explains, through a unique communion with the original image, which is Christ himself, Mary has become so similar to the prototype that all the virtues of the original image have proportionally become her own. Therefore, the image of Mary, which results from the accommodation of these passages to her person, is justified. However, 
The church did not only derive the congruence of wisdom traits with those of Mary by simply comparing the description of wisdom to traits of other versions, virtues of Mary's that might have been otherwise established. Rather, the church concludes from the close communion between Mary and the person of wisdom that her wisdom's description proportionally also fits to Mary. For that reason, one may assume that the application of these wisdom texts to Mary lay as the, I'll explain in a minute, this Latin term, sensus consequence in the intention of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying the Holy Spirit intended as a, se as a consequential sense, so a secondary sense is intended which derives from the primary sense. Because the Holy Spirit knows, of course, that God is going to create the Immaculate Conception, who in all her perfection will be the perfect copy of wisdom incarnate. This association of Mary with the, with the person of wisdom lies, according to Sheben, in the fact that Mary as, and now again he's quoting famous terms from the liturgy, as the Aurora Lucis Sapientia, the dawn of wisdom's light, we call her, and the Mulier Amicta Solis, so the woman clothed with the sun, Revelation 12, is, Mary, is with regard to wisdom in a unique way, its seat, vessel, and dwelling place, and at the same time, it's Christ's bride, and as such, has become entirely one with, with, one with wisdom. And he says, just as Eve and Adam, with respect to their being in the image and likeness of God, vis-a-vis -vis the visible world, belong together in such a way that the description of the man's virtues comprise also those of the woman, insofar as she is with him, and as his likeness, also the likeness of God, so also everything that's being said of wisdom incarnate as the image and likeness of God comprises all that can be said of Mary too. So same as everything we say about Adam is, uh, holds true for Eve also, because the two of them are the image of God, so also everything we say about Christ incarnate is perfectly entirely also true of Mary as the new Eve. As a scriptural proof of Shaban's, um, as a scriptural proof, Shaban beautifully adduces the Song of Songs, in which the bride is described as the perfect likeness of the bridegroom, largely in the same colors as wisdom in Sirach 24:17. Let me explain. Sirach 24:1 to 7. This, this is handout number 14. Describes the dwelling and working of wisdom in the completion of the visible creation in the metaphor of a mist covering the earth and a pillar of cloud. Now this is wisdom's role in creation of the world. This then is set in parallel to wisdom's dwelling and working among men in the form of a fragrant garden and a water source overflowing with wisdom. We have here a perfect prefiguration of the incarnation. Everything that wisdom is and was from all eternity is communicated to her human soul and flesh, which in the biblical language is her tent, her temple tabernacle. It's what Dr. Bergsma said in the morning. Christ's body is his tent and his temple tabernacle. When the creator of all, so God Father, commanded wisdom, the Logos, and put to put down her tent, her skene, he said to her, in Jacob make your dwelling, and in Israel let your inheritance be. The same wisdom, who had her origin in God from all ages, and who will not cease to be in all eternity, ministered before God in the holy tent, that is the mosaic tent, and so was established in Zion, in the city, the text says, which God loves as much as he loves wisdom, he gave her rest, in Jerusalem her domain. That is, God commanded wisdom to take her dwelling in the people of Israel, embodied in the city of Jerusalem, which is Zion. There she struck her roots and grew into a paradisiacal garden, producing a perfume that she herself compares to the odor of incense in the holy tent, thereby restoring the original garden sanctuary of Eden in Jerusalem. 
Unfortunately, we can't go into the details of Sirach 24, but what is described in brief is how wisdom in the gift of the law transforms the people of God, whose cultic center is in the temple of Jerusalem, into the original once lost, but now refound paradise. Wisdom is overflowing like the rivers of paradise to the four corners of the earth, filling the earth with divine wisdom, understanding and instruction. Jerusalem, the covenant bride of God, is being transformed into a paradisiacal garden through the indwelling of divine wisdom. Now you can easily see how the effect of the law in Jerusalem described in Sirach 24, 8 to 17, prefigures the mystery of the incarnation. Sheban explains, this is a historical sensory image, you might also say a, a symbol, which points both backwards to the invisible dwelling and working of wisdom in the completion of creation, so it's pointing to the creation, and it's pointing forward in a typological fashion to the visible corporal appearance of wisdom in the world in the event of the incarnation. John 1.14 echoes God's command to wisdom to make her dwelling in the, in the tent in Jerusalem. Yeah? He said, Take your t pitch your tent in Jerusalem. And then you know what John says in 1.14. And the word was made flesh and tabernacled amongst us. If you, ha if you were translating, it, he didn't dwell amongst us. It's pitched its tent. In Jacob make your dwelling. The canvas for wisdom's tent is none other than Christ's human soul and body, which, like Jerusalem in the image, now shares all of wisdom's glories through the hypostatic union. Christ's humanity is seat and spouse of the eternal wisdom. It has become for us the source of all life, and whoever drinks the water which he will give will never thirst, the water he gives will become, in the believer, a spring of water, dwelling up for eternal life. The sensory image of wisdom taking root in Jerusalem, still Sheben explaining, you're all becoming experts on Sheben, finds a most plastic and vivid fulfillment in the flesh of wisdom incarnate, so in, in Christ's humanity. While it wonderfully characterizes wisdom's supernatural, spiritual, and heavenly being as a daughter of God and mother of the world, it also comprises its symbolic, typological meaning. Sorry, it also comprises in its symbolic and typological meaning, so its prefiguration, per se, the physical mother of wisdom incarnate. Yeah? Because she is finally the flesh from whom the canvas for the tent of wisdom. This is marvelously exemplified in the bride of the Song of Songs. There the bride of the divine bridegroom is praised in a description that resembles the effects of wisdom's descent into Jerusalem almost literally. Um, Dr. Bergsmer uh, cited this text in a different context this morning, also perfectly legitimate, but um, if you, at, uh, at the same time, Song 4, 12 to 11, describes the bride as the interior of the temple in Jerusalem, and the same way as Sirach 24 describes what happens to Jerusalem when wisdom takes its dwelling. Yeah? So by uh, the bridegroom coming into her, she is transformed into the temple, which is nothing other than paradise restored. When he says, a garden locked is my sister, my bride, a garden lock, a fountain sealed, your shoots are a paradise of pomegranates with all choices, fruit, henna and nard, etc., etc. A study has been done, the way the beloved of the Song of Songs is described, 27 terms overlap with the description of Jerusalem in Sirach 24. So the, the lover, who is Christ, coming into his beloved Mary, and thereby humanity, transforms us into what he is. Just like the temple in Jerusalem, in which wisdom has taken its dwelling, so also the bride of the Song of Song has been transformed into a paradisiacal garden, a well of living water, flowing streams from Lebanon. Through her marriage with the divine bridegroom, the bride of the Song of Songs has become the perfect image of paradise restored, a source of living water. Now, according to the unanimous tradition of the church, both West and East, this depiction of God's bride refers first and foremost, to the divinizing effect that wisdom incarnate has had on the woman 
in whom wisdom not only tabernacled for nine months, but whose flesh moreover served as the canvas for wisdom's tent. All of wisdom's attributes can therefore analogically also be predicated of Mary. And for this very reason it might be, so Sheben surmises, that the Holy Spirit had intended for the biblical description of wisdom to also point towards the role of Mary, the spouse and seat of wisdom, in the mystery of the redemption. Now, this was a long theological tractatus. It gets easier now. <laughs> The New Testament seems, in fact, to conform, confirm these dogmatic considerations of the famous German theologian. A precious hint in this direction might have been given in the Gospel of John, more precisely in the passage which tells us that the beloved disciple took Jesus' mother into his own. Remember the last time I cited this? Solomon decided to take wisdom at his, as his spouse. John 1927b. In his testament from the cross, as St. John Paul II calls it, the crucified Christ famously addresses his mother and John, his beloved disciple, with the words, Behold your mother, woman, behold your son. This gesture was not simply a last act of care of, for his own mother, who being a widow had no one to protect and look after her after the death of her only son, as some exodetes wanted to be. Much more importantly, Jesus thus entrusted John and represented by him every other Christian disciple to the eternal maternal care of his own mother. As St. John Paul II powerfully affirms, Mary's motherhood, which becomes man's inheritance, is a gift. A gift which Christ himself makes personally to every individual. The Redeemer entrusts Mary to John because he entrusts John to Mary. At the foot of the cross, there begins that special entrusting of humanity to the mother of Christ, which in the history of the church has been practiced and expressed in different ways. You find this in John Paul II's encyclical Redemptoris Mater. However, the words with which the gospel concludes this scene, from that hour the disciple took her into his own, John 1927b, <laughs> add yet another dimension to this newly established relationship between Mary and John. No other than Cardinal Ratzinger, in a famous commentary on the then Pope John Paul II's encyclical, explicates the deeper meaning of these words to us. Cardinal Ratzinger writes, the Holy Father, John Paul II, offers in this context a very subtle exegesis of the words with which the gospel concludes this scene. From that hour, the disciple took her to his own. That is the usual Sorry, the usual into his own home is the usual translation. But the depth of the event, the Pope stresses, comes to light only when we translate the passage literally. In that case, we would actually have to say, he took her into his own. So not into his own home, which makes it like uh, a little homey scene. No, no, the text says, he took her into his ho own. For the Holy Father... This implies a quite personal relationship between the disciple, every disciple, and Mary. A letting of Mary into the inmost core of one's own mental and spiritual life. A handing over of oneself into her feminine and maternal existence. A reciprocal self-commitment that becomes the ever new way to Christ's birth and brings about Christ's taking form in man. Now I'll explain. Notice how both John Paul II and Cardinal Ratzinger insinuate that the words he took her into his own mean much more than taking care of Mary as a kind of foster mother who needs to be taken care of as a widow. They also need, mean much more than John's acceptance of Mary's maternal role towards himself by taking her into his house. Because 
we ordinarily in the strong sense of the word depend on our own mothers only during our childhood and maybe maximum our teens unless you're an Italian we have <laughs> we have a hard time imagining a group of man uh, sorry we have a hard time imagining a grown up man accepting Mary as his mother in the same way as a newborn baby would allow itself to be adopted. Even though we know in faith that John was born in exactly this moment of water and spirit by Jesus and Mary. The ordinary listener does not imagine John adopting the attitude of a neonate towards his mother. That is why the Pope's interpretation of the words he took her into his own as a reaction to Jesus' words woman behold your son, are all the more astonishing. Though superficially only a mother-son relationship is established, John's reaction was, so St. John Paul II tells us, that John admitted Mary into the inmost core of his mental and spiritual life, into his entire being. And Tell me, where is the son who gives his mother access into the innermost regions of his mental and spiritual life, into the deepest intimacy of his own being? Is that not rather the entry one would grant to a spouse? In fact, Cardinal Ratzinger adds another astonishing phrase. He insinuates that the phrase he took her into his own implies a reciprocal self-commitment, which entailed John, I quote, John's entry into her reality as a woman and mother. That is, handing over of himself into her feminine and maternal existing its existence. That is, not only was John called to grant Mary access into his intimacy, the Pope is also insinuating that John was somehow um, received not only Mary's maternal, but was received into not only Mary's maternal, but into her feminine existence. He distinguishes the two. This, to my mind, is clearly spousal language. Now, if you're tempted to think, and I know you're not because you're all devout American Catholics, but let's presume you're all listening with German ears that are very little inclined to embrace any papal meditation. Now, let's, pre let's presume you're tempted to think that the Pope is reading more into the text than the words. He took her into his own, actually yield. Then let me assure you, that from an exegetical point of view, the Pope is spot on, even if neither the text nor the footnotes reveal that he was aware to what degree his me meditation is covered by the Bible itself, itself. What gives me so much confidence, I think you already know. The previous century was witness to a heated debate between two eminent Catholic scholars of international renown. One was Ignace de la Poterie, whom you might know, the other one is less famous and in applied biblical conferences, Franz Nehring. Pre they were fighting precisely about the exact meaning of these words. He took her into his own, or rather how, how to render this Greek original Ela ben auten eista idia in English. While the debate raged over whether this meant he received her into his faith, as de la Poterie would have it, or whether the exact meaning of the phrase was rather to be rendered, he took her into his own home, which is the one that ended up in most of the Bible translations, both exegetes agreed that the closest biblical parallel to this seemingly elliptic phrase is to be found in Wisdom 8, 18, where King Solomon proclaims that have, after having pondered all of Wisdom's virtues, he decided to take her literally into his own. In the context of Wisdom 8.18, all agree that the expression to take into one's own expresses accurately the image of taking wisdom as a spouse. If this is what it means with regard to Lady Wisdom, then why hesitate so much in recognizing the same metaphor in John's relationship to Mary? The spousal meaning, obviously, does not impose itself overtly in the context of the crucifixion, where Jesus expressly entrusts Mary and John as mother and son towards each other. And yet, if we take the evangelist by his word, the spousal imagery is exactly the image he might have had in mind. 
As we have already seen, it's also the meaning which St. John Paul II seems to have uncovered in his own meditation on Mary's role in the life of the disciple. The Gospel of John is, of course, the most spiritual of all. And so we must not make the mistake to understand John as having taken Mary literally as a spouse. Rather, a deeper spousal relationship on the spiritual level is being hinted at here just like the parallel to King Solomon's spousal relationship to Lady Wisdom reveals, which after all was also sp purely spiritual. This is furthermore confirmed if we read the scene in the wider context. As you are surely all aware of, because you're all faithful readers of Dr. Han's books, Mary is here addressed as woman, rather than by her first name, for highly significant reasons. This title evokes at once the so-called proto-gospel of Genesis 3.15, the wedding of Cana, and Revelation 12. Now that Jesus' hour has come, Mary is revealed as the new Eve, participating in a unique, even if subordinate, but still unique way in the crushing of the serpent's head. The wedding is consumed and the new wine of the Holy Spirit is being given. In the theology of the Gospel of John, Mary is not only the mother of Jesus, but also the spouse of the new Adam, who together with him gives birth to the new humanity, represented by John's presence underneath the cross, the eschatological people of God. Ignace de la Poterie adds one more important observation. In John 1, 11 to 13, we read, He came into his own, and his own did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but God. Notice, those who receive Jesus into their own are given the power to become children of God. Curiously, Jesus commands John to do this exact same with Mary in the very hour that this regeneration of the children of God is taking place. It is as if he were saying, receive her and you will be receiving me. This seems to be also the meaning which John Paul II in the reading of Joseph Ratzinger gathered from these words when he writes that taking Mary into one's own refers to a handing oneself over into her feminine and maternal existence, a reciprocal self-commitment that becomes the ever new way to Christ's birth and brings about Christ's taking form in man. By receiving Mary into our own and handing herself over into her feminine and maternal existence, Christ is being born and takes on form in us. Is that not exactly what scripture confesses with regard to Lady Wisdom? Passing into holy souls from age to age, she produces friends of God and prophets, for God loves nothing so much as the one who dwells with wisdom. The sublime way of acquiring wisdom as a wife, sister, mother, and bride then, so the Gospel of John seems to suggest, thereby confirming anything that Grignon ever taught in this respect, is by taking into one's inmost being the seat of wisdom, the Virgin Mother of Mary, who through her own unique position as a spouse of both God and man will bring about as it were, another incarnation. It's a term from Elizabeth of the Trinity. Will bring about, as it were, another incarnation of the eternal wisdom in our humble human souls. With this, let us close with the prayer. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who reveals to us your mystery, the mystery of wisdom incarnate. We thank you, Lord, that you love us with a greater love than a young man rejoices over his bride. You truly are the spouse of our soul. And we thank you for having given us Mary and calling us to love her with that same love with which we are called to love you. Thank you for having made her the mediatrix of all grace. Thank you for having given us a prefiguration of whom she is in those beautiful wisdom texts. Thank you for every grace and seed you have sown in our soul in this 75 minutes. Lord, 
With John, we want to receive Mary into our inmost being so as to become entirely dependent on her and through her of you. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Congratulations, you survived your German lecture. <laughs>